Okay, that, that, is, that is the whole. And the more complex, the more parts. And I'll get to that. So C and B cannot increase without an increase in the division of labor. And Lyndon LaRouche uses the example of, of the worldwide cup of coffee. This is from 40 some years ago, 50 years ago. Um, you know, you, you, you're sitting in your living room or in your kitchen in the morning and you're drinking a cup of coffee. Do you realize what it took to produce the beans that went into your coffee? You know, the growing of the beans, the, the trucks that brought them down to the to the port, the ships that took them into the, into the, uh, you know, do you, do you have any idea of all the inputs that went into that? And you can actually trace it out through something called a bill of materials. And then what about the cup that you're drinking it on? Where did that come from? And so you, 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 you can trace out a worldwide division of labor, a worldwide, uh, for everything that you produce, everything that you consume. That's physical. Another example. So, so another example that I like to use is this idea of the automation. Uh, the, the other idea, the other conception I, I like to use is the industrialization of milking. In other words, in the old days, you had a, you, you had all these people employed milking by hand. And then the milk would go into the local town or local village or whatever and be sold. With the industrialization of milking, all those people no longer work at milking. So where did they go? But what about the what what is but but to create the industrialization of milking is a huge machines and trucks and you know refrigeration and everything is huge. The manufacturing that would go into far is far greater than all the people you displaced. So you have a much greater division of labor, you have to have a greater population. But it's not just a greater population, it's a greater population that's engaged in the productive process. This is very important. Now we come to the one that people have the hardest time with. Automation. This was something LaRouche got hit with in the 50s. All these people were talking about how we didn't have to have work, a work, working class anymore because we were going to automate everything. And that somehow uh, we could reduce the population and automate and, and so forth and so on. And you know, people won't have to work. They, you know, everything's going to be the ones who are not. You know, everything's going to be entertainment and leisure and, and all this. This is totally insane. Automation is an incredible expansion of the division, requires an incredible expansion of the division of labor. And a shift towards, you know, a lot of the production now is, is automated. But the amount of other things you have to do to keep it going, in terms of the computers and, and everything that goes with it, it's just... It's just way huge. You need a much larger division of labor than you had before. You need, but people aren't working in the same way they were before. They're working in a very different way. And the tendency will be to go to much more of, of, of engineering, computer, computers, engineering, uh, programming, um, uh, all kinds of things. Maintenance. Maintenance. Huh? Maintenance. All kinds of things that I. I can't even imagine. Okay? And then all of the things that go into that, and all of the things that go into that, and all of the things that go into that. It, again, you're, you're expanding your division of labor. Okay, so. Um, now. Now, if the absolute number of people available to be incorporated in the worldwide division of labor is a boundary that limits the ability to produce. That's what this is about. 
If China is going to have a middle class existence for 1.4 billion people, the amount of skilled labor on the planet, the infrastructure on the planet, and the living standards of all the workers on the planet today is insufficient for making that possible for China. Through trade. The division of labor of the planet has to dramatically expand in order for this to happen. Now what do I mean by that? Take Africa. Africa is one of the places that has, it now has 1.3 billion people. All of Africa has 1.3 billion people. However, a large portion of the African population exists in what's called rural subsistence. What is rural subsistence? You know what rural subsistence is. <laughs> you lived it. You know exactly what it is. <laughs> you're living off the land. Yeah, you're just living off the land. But you're not part of this worldwide division of labor. Right? You're not contributing to the worldwide division of labor. And also your living standard is very, very low. Very, very low. So, so, a rural subsistence form of peasant poverty is a huge net loss to the global economy. China, when China, what China means getting people out of poverty, I gotta explain this. It does, it, it's not, it's getting people out of that kind of existence into a, a, a more productive existence. It's not middle class. What China wants to bring all the population into the middle class, but when they mean getting out of poverty, they mean getting out of that circumstance and having, you know, a, a productive, a productive life in the in the village, in the town, wherever, and connected to everything, and so forth. So that's what they mean, getting people off of that subsistence existence. And when they mean middle class, they mean much. They mean a lot. They mean a quantum leap above above that. Um, so China understands that their future well-being is tied to the industrial transformation of Africa. They understand that. Now another way of measuring uh, an economy is the density of energy activity, population, infrastructure per square kilometer. That's another way of, of measuring it. And in this context, this is the big one. One can begin to understand from this how absolutely destructive to humanity the environmentalist, the Green Movement is. Because they shut all of this down. Spain is making a decision not only to, to, to abandon nuclear power into the future, but also coal, also carbon. Germany is stepping up this decision. Do they have any clue what they're doing to their future? They would have a clue if they had any idea what we're talking about tonight. So this green movement is very very destructive, far more destructive than the population realizes, than even most people here realize, than even uh, perhaps even the, the people who are attacking the Greens realize it's extremely destructive. I have a feeling Donald Trump has a sense of that. He, uh, and he does reject green, green ideology. <coughs> now I'm going to shift into the historical uh, component of it. That, I want to present this now in a, in a historical economic way. So I'll come over here. Okay. Um, so this is the pre agricultural. Now I have no idea what these population figures are, whether they're right or wrong, but they seem to be within a kind of a, um, a range. So this is, this is pre agriculture. That's with no agriculture. We're talking pre-Neolithic or whatever people call the agricultural period. And you'll notice there is no C and there is no S. Everything is V. Everything 
Everybody's involved in survive, surviving and producing for the, for, the, for the group and surviving off what they produce, but because it's primarily, uh, it's primarily hunting, gathering, and so forth. <coughs> there is no C, there is no V. I mean, there is no C, there is no S, there is no D prime. That's, that's the pre-agricultural society. You might, you might want to call some, some, some dwellings fixed capital, but, they, uh, but they're really not. Okay. You can't. You don't want to really call spears and arrows fixed capital. They're not. Okay. Now, when you get into an agricultural, you make the transition to agriculture. You you have. I, this is also a rough estimate. At, at the earlier phases, you know, it's probably less than fifty million. But by the time of Rome, it's probably globally. You know, Rome Rome is about twenty six. 30, China was about more. So, and then you had you had agriculture in Africa and in India and the Middle East. So I, I would estimate probably 100 million people at least. But I, I, I use the term 50 million. Central America. Huh? Central America. Central America. South America. Yeah, South America by the time of Rome. So, so I would say up to the up to about uh, the year. 1790, when the Industrial Revolution really got on, 1770, 1780, you have roughly uh, about a billion people. Now, that's not the product. That's not the potential population. That's the actual population. And then, when you go into the industrial period, you go through the early industrial period to now, you have a, uh, a potential for more than what we have now. So I, I, I put in 15 billion. Uh, you know, that, I, that's arbitrary on my part. And then, then the fusion-based economy is. <laughs> it's much bigger. Now, let's look at the compositions. In the agricultural society, you have a large uh, peasant population that produces the food. You have some constant capital in the form of roads, and in and, and the form of windmills, and, and in some cases in the form of, of, of water, waterworks, you know, canals. Uh, in the forms of, 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 but it's very minimal. Draft animals. Huh? Draft animals. That would be, yeah, draft animals, but that, that's borderline, yeah. But yeah, maintaining the ground, yeah. <coughs> and then you'd have a certain amount of surplus, probably a lot less in proportion than what you see right here. And then you, and this would go for your lords and priests and, and all of this, that whole, that whole class would be based on that, and that would be the net surplus. So that's about, this probably, this is probably smaller relative to this, but, but that's the way it is. Now when you get to a, an industrial economy, it's, 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 you have a much bigger D, and so forth. These are, these are proportions. These are, <coughs> and then when you get to a fusion economy, your, your V shrinks dramatically. Because it's, it's, it's automated, there's a lot more automation, but your D expands massively, and, and necessarily so. And your S prime has to be very large because you have to keep this, this thing going. Where's the surplus? Where's the S? S prime? Right here. S and S prime are not the same, are they? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. S. S. Yeah. That's the surplus, okay. So S1 plus D is. Yeah. S can include both over oh, yeah. and S. Both, both of these are S. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And S prime is an S. Yeah. Now, th this is pretty pretty rough what I'm telling you and it's kind of compressed. Um, but based on the on this con these conceptions, uh a more developed version of this, uh, they're not hard to understand. It, it is just the noise and attacks on anyone who discusses this in this way that prevents people from focusing on these concepts so that they can be applied. Uh, this, this model, which LaRouche is, he doesn't use these terms anymore, but I find these terms to be, uh, to be useful, to give you a sense of the, the compositions of, of, uh, of, of, of the, where the product 
what's being produced and how it's being consumed as the essential aspect of, of, of it. Now, LaRouche has successfully applied this concept to economic forecasting and forecasting as well as to the political consequences of economic policy decision as they affect this. So if you, you can analyze the policies of the Federal Reserve, the financial system, and what effect they're going to have on this to project what the consequences will be to the whole physical economy, and then you can project that to how sections of the population are going to respond to that relationship. If the economy is being properly developed, people are going to become optimistic, they're going to want to have families, they're, they're, they're going to feel more uh, productive, and that's going to have a political effects. And if, if it's going the other way, which it has been for a long time, then people are going to become more depressed, they're going to become um, more poor, they're going to become more angry, and so on and so forth. So drugs, this is... Drugs and booze. Huh? Drugs and booze, suicide. Yeah, yeah. So, so basically, you can project, based on, on the decisions that are being made by the policy people, on where this is going to go. So, but you can also project uh, economic collapses. And... Secondly, without this conception of an economy, uh, which everyone in our movement over many years has pretty much has a sense of, uh, we would not have a sense of enough, enough of a sense of reality to have survived these years. <laughs> but we have maintained, because of this orientation, despite everything, and although some of us have waned in our, 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 we need to be refreshed in this respect, uh, because we have a sense of this reality that we have sustained a movement in spite of all of that, in spite of everything that we've been hit with, because we, we have always known that there was a physical reality that bounded the reality of, of the garbage that was coming down, of the financial decision. We always knew there was a physical reality. We always knew where it would end up, where it would go as a result of the policies. That's why some of us stayed in as long as we did, because we always knew that this is where it was going. But we knew why. We had, we had confidence in LaRouche's uh, economic ideas, because we had studied them and we had applied them and we had thought them through. And therefore, we knew that that was the reality. And so this is, we're talking decades. We, I was telling people this reality 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and everyone was telling me I was nuts. But here we are. They're not telling me I'm nuts anymore. They mainly want to know where they want to put their money. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so, but also this economic, these economic ideas are also key for making future policy decisions. Okay, you want to go for a crash fusion program. You want to go for advanced nuclear power. You want to go for the kind of infrastructure the Chinese are building. Somebody just wrote a, an article on Maglev. The Chinese are building 39 lines, something like that, of, of low-speed Maglev to, as a subway system to integrate an area of 24 million people in Shanghai. Such that not one person in that 24 million er person area is more than a half a mile away from the subway station. And Maglev kind of going to grab. Yeah. Uh, and Maglev is very, once you build it, it's the, it's the maintenance costs are, are very low. It's run by a <laughs> magnetic levitation. <laughs> okay. And, uh, oh, it's the levitation. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they've developed the technology. And what this person was saying is you can take the entire eastern seaboard of the United States 
and, and integrate it through Magna and end all this congestion on these roads and, and just the hell that people go through now because um, these roads are just congested. I mean, uh, it, it's just gotten really bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, LaRouche's economic ideas are also, uh, so you can make policy decisions based on this. You can, you can make investment decisions in terms of your whole society. And the way it works is you have the credit, and then you start the infrastructure projects. And the infrastructure project is a way, building the infrastructure project is a way of transforming the S prime into C. Because how you, so you make that, so you have a surplus, right? The surplus is only, it's in a physical form. How are you going to get that physical surplus into, into transforming, into improving the, the, the economy as a whole? You have to have a driver. You have a science driver, you, you have an infrastructure driver. You, you can't, and, and a consumer driver, well, that has some issues. But, but that's how you do it. And if you know this and you plan that way, then you have a credit system that goes in, that's in conjunction with that. And once you have a fixed exchange system between nations, the way it works is, it, this is very important. Now, this is a very important point I'm going to make. Okay. The U.S. has a massive amount of debt out there. You do not want to cancel it. The ability of the U.S. to create debt, and the ability of China to create debt, and the ability of India to create debt, and the ability of Russia to create debt, is what you're going to use to, re to, to, to fuel the world economy, to build the world economy. You just don't want the speculators to control it. So if you have a fixed exchange system, the way it would work is we would encourage every nation to have their own uh, uh, national bank. And that national bank would take in dollars and convert them to the local currency internally at a fixed rate. But that national bank would also issue currency, would also issue credit in its own currency locally. So, it, so you wouldn't have dollars coming in as a debt being imposed as a debt on that country. You would have, that debt would be in their own currency and the loans would come in and be converted into their own currency. It wouldn't, you wouldn't have, and you, because, it, because it's fixed, you, they could pay back in their own currency. But this is a political agreement. It's completely political. And it's the only way to deal with this. So all that debt of the United States and Canada becomes becomes uh, can be can be converted into credit or can be converted into backed up backup uh, uh, credit. So you don't want to collapse the dollar. You don't want to collapse any of these currencies. But you've got to get the speculators out of the out of the, the system. They have to be stopped. They have to be shut down. And right now they're causing a lot of havoc. They declared war on the Belt and Road. So, now, finally, this apparently simple thing that I just described, which is not really simple, is the first time that I'm aware of that there has been a scientific means to have a way of knowing what you're doing economically as a nation. Rigor scientifically. I'm not saying Hamilton didn't know, he did know. I'm not saying other people like Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Lincoln did, didn't know. Other people in other parts of the world didn't know. But to do it scientifically. And Ultimately, because of the existence of these ideas in the future, there will be no excuse for economic collapse. No more excuses for economic you, you don't have to have an economic collapse anymore. Once this is under, fully understood and applied, you will not have economic collapses. Or economic cycles. Or economic cycles. Well, you have, 
Yes, you do have economic cycles, but they're not, they're not of that nature. They're, they're consumption cycles. You know. Well, just as you go from stage to stage. The consumption cycles are, you know, how long it takes for, for a dam, you know, how long it takes for, you know, consumption cycles. In that sense, they're cycles. You know, things wear out over time. Intrusion? Yeah, that kind of, those kind of cycles. Those economic, but not, not in terms of a financially driven boom bust. Yeah, cycle. Who bus cycle? Yeah, no, no more. Now, there are also universal and theological implications of LaRouche's economic ideas. Um, if the culture and the individual in society and in the culture are driving an expansion of this into space and beyond, then the universe is not entropic. It is not running down. It is not fixed. Now it's probably not, not, not entropic otherwise, but this is the fact that human beings have that potential and can continue this process into space and beyond is 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 a is a proof it's a it's a proof against entropy or it's a, it's a it's it's a indication that entropy is not is not the way the universe really works <laughs> and if the nature of humans is to make discoveries of how the universe works and apply those discoveries to increase this because the discoveries that you make have to be discoveries that increase this then truly the theological formulation of man in the image of the creator has resonance with this has resonance with this concept with this with this with this with physical economics as an actual physical transformative process in the universe that mirrors God's intention of a continually developing universe. Now here's, here's, here's the big theological issue. The universe has to be continually developing because otherwise a fixed universe is a dead universe. And a dead universe means that God is dead. That's, that's where you get in all the theology. Yeah, I don't want to go too far into that. But. So, now the thing about the oligarchy is they reject this. They reject all of this. Which is why they are a moral threat to the, human, uh, to the future of humanity. They are a moral threat to the future because they reject all of it. They reject the whole concept. They want to fix society. They want a fixed uh, system. They want something that they can have fixed, permanent. The end of history. The Third Reich, the Third Rome. You know, they're all, they're looking for a way to create a fixed world. You can't have a fixed world. <laughs> like uh, it's biological. How is that going to be fixed? They're going to try and take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So finally, uh, thank you. Finally. Elements associated with the Russian Orthodox Church have indicated that Russia's economic ideas, by implication, is a new possible proof for the existence of God. So, are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> when was that? <laughs> that was that was a uh, that was an article in Sastra, which uh, about ten years ago. Oh. <laughs> Anyhow, I'll stop there and open it up for questions. Okay. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Amen. 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 Right. I just want to add what uh, a funny experience today. Uh, Tony Jennings, one of my my uh, my contemporary generational organizers, sent me an email, and it was a 12-minute video of Donald Trump. With all of the fire people, all the people at the fire at uh, in in, uh, in California, 
And he's, he, and the video starts with Trump standing here, and there's this huge map, and people are talking to him, and he's pointing out to this, and he's pointing out to that. And I can't quite make out what's going on, right? And uh, this is ser he looked very serious. It's a very serious situation in California. And then in comes this guy a few minutes later, and they make room for him, and he's standing next to him. And I'm looking at this guy, and it's Governor Brown. Now, Governor Brown had earlier said that the cause of all these fires was, was not mismanagement, but was global warming. Uh, was uh, federal responsibility. Yeah, and, and, and so forth. So, now the mismanagement aspect is that they haven't been, uh, they haven't been um, maintaining the force. They, they, the budget cuts and the droughts and everything else like that. So anyhow, so Trump's talking to the governor and, and then he gives a press conference and then the governor says a few things and then Trump has um, somebody that, and then there's reporters that you can't see and they're shouting, one of them is shouting in, and what about climate change? And Trump says, no, it's force management and we're putting $500 million in and this is going to change. We're going to have a federal, local, and state uh, commitment to properly maintain the forests. And there's Governor Brown. <laughs> and, and Governor Brown looked like he was having trouble talking. It, it, I think he's, something's going wrong with his health or something. But anyhow, but it was so, it was so like, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> we're not doing the climate change thing. We're going to manage the forest. We're going to stop off. We're going to deal with the problem. We're going to manage the forest. And it was it was very uh, it was very it's very good. I liked it. I mean, it was like <laughs> it was like this is what we're gonna do, okay? And everybody agreed. Everybody there included the covering <laughs> So I, I thought I'd mention that because it, it 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 was funny. So um, so I want to go through a couple things with you uh, because I don't think it's fully clear uh, what the situation is. Um, the midterm election has passed, and the result was a greater consolidation of Trump as the president of the United States. Now, it's not, it's, it's greater than it was before. Uh, this was crucial because without bringing the U.S. into a new paradigm of sovereign national development for all nations, there would be no hope for the human race. And the potential for that has increased with the increase of, of of the, situ of the position of Trump, but it is, we're still a long ways away, and there's still a huge mess, and a huge battle, and all of that, but we're not, we've actually moved up a bit. So now, our, our job is more, at a more higher level, and more complicated, because we have to get across what the, what the economic aspect of this new paradigm is, in terms of, 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 of policies, which you, you're familiar with, the four, the four laws, the, the, the New Brighton Woods, the, the fixed exchange system, and all of that. But, but, uh, and, and, but what, are the, what are the ideas on which uh, LaRouche is based all of this on is what I will talk about later tonight. And, 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 um, so, so now to understand why we say, okay, so, so the House is now in the hands of the Democrats. The Senate is in the hands of the Republicans. I mean, so what, how did Trump do better? Well, here's, here's why. Uh, Trump's high-power campaign was so strong that the Democrats and these key races were put on, were put on the spot. If they campaigned to impeach Trump, they would alienate a large portion of the traditional Democratic voters who are actually supporting Trump because they didn't see Trump as a Republican. Now, many of these voters were not really, were not enthusiastic about the local Republican candidate that they were running against, that they were, um, that was running against a Democrat. And they're Democrats. They're traditionally Democrats. So they would tend to vote for the Democratic candidate in the local race. So if you were a Democratic candidate and you wanted to guarantee your election in, in, in some of these crucial districts, 
you would you would not want to want to alienate those voters because you would probably lose because they would go over to the Republicans even though they didn't like the Republicans because you're you're attacking the, you know they support Trump you're attacking Trump so what happened was that uh, that a lot of the people who were running on a on an impeached Trump uh, uh, platform were defeated. And most Democrats in those key races who were running on a don't impeach Trump, let's 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 not deal with that, they won. And that's very important. Uh, the, probably the most salient case is in Texas. I mean Ted Cruz is not my favorite Republican, okay? I mean, you know, the guy is <laughs> but Bayer O'Rourke, the guy running against him, would have won the election if he had not campaigned for impeachment of Trump. He would have won the election. But he ran on impeachment of Trump and he lost the election. He lost the election to, uh, for that reason. Okay. So, so that's significant. Now, on the other hand, those Republicans who decided to throw in their lot with Trump fared a lot better than those Republicans in these key races who did not. So it's because of that that Trump essentially became more powerful as a result and in, in more consolidated. Now there's huge battles coming. Uh, the, the, uh, the Mueller situation has not been resolved, although Trump has now a caretaker attorney general for another 200 days or so, um, minimally. And um, and so, so a lot of stuff isn't resolved, but his position is much stronger. And, and there's, there's going to be a lot of crap uh, from the media and so forth. Uh, and much more desperate attacks on Trump, on China, on Russia, the Belt and Road. You know, you're going to see much more effort on the part of Pence to, uh, to, to go against Trump. Uh, and, and try to be the try to be the guy for the you know try to represent the the alternative since since that's coming from the neocons and Republican neocons. So going forward, Trump will be meeting a week from Friday with Putin, where the issue of dealing with establishing uh, um, I lost the page here. Oh, okay. Uh, 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 some kind of way of dealing with all these, uh, all these uh, fires, you know, Ukraine, Middle East, uh, INF treaty, all of these, uh, all these problems that were that were set into motion that Trump hasn't been able to deal with. He'll be having a, uh, a discussion with Putin, and I'm certain that. The issue of, of, of establishing a global security architecture, a new global security architecture, is obviously going to come up because that's what Putin is going to bring up to stop the drift towards nuclear war. So that's one aspect, which was created by the two previous administrations. And then also going forward is the summit on, uh, on the same day with Xi Jinping uh, on how to resolve the trade issues and how the U.S. will fit into a relationship with China that is not confrontational. And uh, it's being discussed right now that there will be not a full agreement but a um, but some kind of framework, they use the word framework, for creating an agreement. So they're talking about a framework of discussion for arriving at an agreement. And uh, Trump has put out 42 things that he wants the Chinese to do and demands, and then, and then now they're going to they're have to start negotiating. Uh, both of these meetings and, and every, is, being, is being attacked with everything the British have, with everything the international financial crowd has. Uh, the Belt and Road and China's promotion of the globally is also being met with China opening up to imports for its rising middle class. Now this is very significant. At the Chinese International Import Expo, there were 3,600 exhibits and 40, 400,000 participants. 400,000 people came to, to discuss 
uh, contracts on importing, on exporting to China. So China is opening up uh, to bring in things from all over the world as it is expanding its, its, uh, its belt and road. However, the problem of the disintegrating system had, has to be dealt with. Right now, the biggest fear of contagion is the corporate debt bubble. You have 1.4 trillion loans to corporations that have gone in to buy stock buybacks. 115 billion of that is for FANG, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. <laughs> the explosion of cash from pension funds and institutions is increasing corporate data at a rocket rate, and all of this is being bundled into, uh, into uh, uh, collateral uh, loan obligations. That is, they're being collateralized like the mortgages were before. And this is very worrying. There's, the IMF is putting out a warning. <coughs> and along with this picture, as the Belt and Road expands, and trade expands with it, and as international bankers declare war on the Belt and Road through speculative attacks on currencies and raising U.S. interest rates to draw uh, capital flight out of the Belt and Road areas, nations have been increasingly resorting to other way, to ways to get around the, the, the dollar system through currency swaps, etc. But it doesn't work because much of what is produced is divided between a number of countries. So, so you have many more countries involved in the production of things in two countries. So a system has to be coming to replace the system. That new system, that new architecture is the new Bretton Woods fixed exchange system that replaces the current, current floating exchange system. The US and China can begin discussing that November 30th in Buenos Aires and then bring Russia and India in. So, so that's really the situation that we're in. This is, this is a different situation than we were in before the midterms. Everybody was waiting for the midterms to end. Now we're in a situation where this has to come up in discussions. Now the problem is we could go into Congress with a, with a, with a, with a, a revival of Glass-Steagall or a national bank or something like that, but it wouldn't mean much because most of the Democrats who would support it still have a green problem. Severe green problems. So they would want their idea. Oh yeah, we'll have we'll have uh, glass steel so we can fund solar windmills and all of that stuff. But really, it's going to come from the international level, the, from the international level through the presidency down through the Congress. It's not going to come from the Congress up through the through the president to the international level. So the the, the, the dialogue that Trump is going to have with Putin and G G and further dialogues beyond that and, and other dialogues with other leaders. And also Japan is coming in, and Turkey is coming in too, to this also. And India is coming in. So all of this is, 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 is a process. The only reason, the, the issue of the, of the stability of Trump is the issue of whether the United States can actually have a dialogue, a meaningful dialogue on this. And can the United States make agreements that are, that are doable because of, 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 of Trump's political stability. That's the fundamental issue that we're looking at here. The issue at this point isn't that Trump is against all of this. The issue is whether he has the stability or whether he's able to, to actually organize the U.S. into this. Should that be the decision that he makes? And if he does make that decision, does he have the means internally to, to bring the United States in? So these are a lot of ifs. These are the ifs we want to we make sure happen. So since LaRouche is the author of the conception of that new system, what I want to do tonight is give a mini, very mini class on aspects of LaRouche's unique economic concepts and the basic conceptual tools required in order to, uh, in order to get a, a, a sense of how you, would, how you would order the economic relations between nations. And uh, so, I'll start with that now. Okay, so I'll start with this. What is an economy? And the definition I'm going to give you is one that is not, is not agreed to by anyone, any other uh, entity that we have known. <clears throat> An economy is a system of reproduction and consumption whereby society reproduces itself. An economy is a physical system. It's a physical system. 
As a physical system, it has boundaries and laws. It is first and foremost subject to the scientific, it is subject to scientific examination of its workings as a physical system. If I were to say this to any economics class in the nation, I would be lynched. All economics courses that I am aware of reject the, this idea of an economy being a physically reproductive system which has, uh, which can be examined scientifically. It's not a matter, it's not a subjective issue of, of you know, market demand and, and uh, supply and demand and marginal utility and all these other things that they use to describe an economy, whether it's macro, uh, macroeconomics, that is. So now I'm going to get into the, to the original form of LaRouche's presentation of his discovery in an understandable way for people back in the 70s. And this was his original economics class that he taught at the New School for Social Research back in the late, eight, late 60s. This comes out of that. So now we're going to get into the actual meat of it. Uh, so, um, so what are the components of a physical economy? Now, this is this is a conceptual. This is purely conceptual, but these are the relationships are real. Okay, the relationships are real, but you have to conceptualize it. So the first thing. It's called constant capital. That's this right here. Now what is constant capital? Constant capital is that which is consumed by the maintaining of the physical plant and equipment, the infrastructure. The dams, the waterways, the roads, the buildings, the plant and equipment. And Constant capital generally has a longer cycle than, than a year. It has maybe uh, anywhere from five, seven, ten. And constant capital is what you is that which is produced to maintain that, which is the infrastructure. Now this bar diagram represents all the things that are produced and consumed. Okay. That's what this bar diagram it represents. And what we have here is constant capital. The second term is called variable capital. Variable capital is that which is produced and consumed to sustain only the, the, fam the households that are involved in direct physical production. That's variable capital. It's a very important distinction between those who are engaged in direct physical production and those who are not, because those who are not are being sustained by those who are, and while they may make a contribution to the overall situation, they are not directly engaged in physical production and thereby they have to be maintained by the actual physical product of the whole of the physical production. You cannot put those two in the same category. Their consumption and their and, and whatever it is that they do are not the same. One is one is and I'll get to what yep that one is called overhead and I'll get into that in a second. So sustain the households of those working in the and, and that's variable capital. And, it, and it's variable capital because it is being consumed all the time. It's coming in, it's coming out, it's maintaining the home, it's maintaining the house, the car, the food, the supplies, whatever that a, the, the household of, a, of a mind, this is a con conceptual, the household of those who are involved in, in, in physical production. Why do we call it household, not individual? Because because it because the, the 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 population is not simply individuals. It's it, it's in the form of reproductive units. And of course, in the recent period, our reproductive unit have kind of broken down somewhat. But that's the way you have to conceive of of, of of a household. It could be two people. It could be it could be a family. 
the so that which is left over from maintaining the workforce and maintaining the physical infrastructure we call surplus. That's the surplus. Now, this is not in any monetary terms. This is actual physical surplus. But the problem is how do you take the physical surplus and realize it? It's, it's the way that an economy is organized. But that's your surplus. That's the surplus that you created. Um, okay, that's the surplus that you have created. Next comes overhead. Now, next comes overhead. Overhead is what is used to maintain the government, the, the schools, the military, <laughs> Hollywood, uh, the retail sector, um, everything else. That's called overhead. Maintain what? It's to maintain the individuals and the operatives involved in the overhead. It's, and also, uh, anything that goes into building the, uh, the machinery that goes into build, uh, the, 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 the goods that are deployed into the military is overhead. So it has, a, so it does have a con it ha does have a, a a a physical component that's not humans consuming. It's also the consumption of office buildings and caused by office buildings, military. So that's called overhead. That's a, that is not productive. It is being sustained by what's productive. To some degree, ed educating the workforce is productive. But it's not, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not cl classified as that. And then, if there's anything left over, it is called, um, it's called uh, S prime, net surplus. That's what, that's, those are the terms that we we'll use for it. So, so now, from all of this, LaRouche develops a, 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 uh, a ratio of how you describe a successful economy. It's the net surplus, S plus 1, over C plus V. This is the net surplus, S prime over C plus V, the famous S prime over C plus V. And what LaRouche is saying is, this is how you judge whether an economy is growing and, and is getting better or is not. If this ratio of S prime over C plus V is increasing, then the, the result of, 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 of your deployment of the surplus of your physical surplus into the physical economy, back into the physical economy, is creating a greater potential to create net surplus. That, if that ratio is rising, then that means you have a healthy, you have a positive, healthy economy. If that ratio is going down, then it's going in the other direction. And if you reach a point like we have where there is no S prime, but rather D is growing in proportion to V and C, meaning the overhead is growing in proportion to V and C, which is what the post-industrial society is, then essentially you're collapsing, not only you, you're collapsing this ratio, but you're collapsing the future, future uh, ability to sustain the, the, the physical economy. Now, there's another measurement of this in terms of population. Okay, these, this ratio also def defines the potential population density that can be sustained by the total product of the physical economy. And so that's called potential population So this is another measure, not this, this thing here, this is, a, this is similar, this, has a, this is related to this, but this is another measure of the power of your economy. So, so one is 
the increase of, of s prime over c plus b is a directionality. The other way to say it is that uh, the, the increase in potential population density, which is not your actual population, but what the full economy can sustain population-wise, that is also a measure. If that's increasing, it also means that this is increasing. And that's how you measure it. And those measurements are physical. They're not, they're not, they're not, they're not arbitrary. This is a physical economy. Yes, there's cultural aspects that are very important, scientific discoveries are very important, all of that's very important. But, you, but it has a physical result in the real world in terms of, a, of, 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 of the whole economy. So, so when you talk about what kind of money system or credit system you're going to have, you want to have one that allows you to take your surplus and, or your, your net surplus and put it back in physically redeploy it. In, 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 into, into C and V so that you can actually have a future. But in current economic theory, there is no way to describe how to do that. There is no conception of even how that's done. It doesn't exist. This entire conception of an economy, it's not categories. These are not categories. These are conceptions. These are not categories. This is not a category. This is a way of looking at the entire physical economy. Okay. Uh, now, C plus V has to increase so that S prime increases. But D cannot be so large that investments in C plus V are lessened or are cut as in order that D expands. And C and V is not, can, cannot be, uh, you can't destroy, you can't cut the proportion with respect. Uh, if, D, if D is growing relative to V and C, that's fine, but if it's growing at a rate that cuts uh, B and C down, then you're, you're, you're collapsing your economy. If the legal and political system and trade relations on the planet are not increasing, C and B, but instead is diverting or um, diverting or destroying or or not not or or if you have waste or you have luxuries, the inputs and outputs into D, which spending by the rich, the financial sector, the military, etc., then S prime will drop and most likely cease to exist leaving no net surplus to expand C plus V. Thus the consequences of outsourcing and the post-industrial society has vastly reduced C plus V with an exponentially increasing D overhead leading to a drop globally in the relative potential population density of the planet. This is what's been going on since the 70s. The US economy and from the 70s and the European economy from a little bit later, they have been a net loss of the of S sub prime over C plus B and the net loss of the relative potential population density. So when LaRouche says the economy has its, its productive power has lost, the monetary growth is great, you know, the real estate growth, the growth of, of, of D has been astronomical. But the the number of people in the workforce who are who are productive has declined dramatically. China's Belt and Road is an effort to rapidly and dramatically increase cost of capital on a massive scale and also increase the, the, the increase the number of productive offers on a massive and global scale. Because otherwise, there would be a planetary collapse into a new dark age. On this alone, we face a potential human extinction. Now comes the problem of increasing C plus B 
in the context of a fixed level of technology, science, and culture. Okay, so now we, we're coming to, to, to the problem of C plus, uh, of C and, and B, or primarily C. The increase or to maintain C and B runs into a resource extraction boundary with respect to any fixed level of science, technology, uh, energy density, and culture. In other words, everything that you've consumed whether it be food from the ground or whether it be uh, anything that's produced has to come from some raw material uh, or it has to come from the soil. Okay? Resources defined by the existing knowledge as resources defined by the existing knowledge are extracted the, the, the easier to extract resources are used up and the more difficult to extract resources become more costly. Unless there are scientific breakthroughs in redefining the resources that can be extracted, there's a running down problem of having to expand the amount of infrastructure and labor to get the same or less. So essentially, you have to increase your population to get the same amount. You have to increase your constant capital to get the same amount. That's why all fixed societies have to collapse, ultimately. It may take a while. So that's a very important function. That's a very important thing to keep in mind. And that's one of the boundaries of, of, of an economy, is you have to innovate. And the more developed you are, the more you have to innovate more. Right? That, that's, you have to make discoveries. That it becomes even more imperative. And you'll see in a minute what, why I'm saying that. Now, here comes another boundary condition. A physical economy is not arbitrary. There are scientific laws. An economy is bounded by physical laws. One of those boundaries, which Hamilton understood is the relationship of the population, uh, C plus B density per square kilometer, and the division of labor. So what we're talking now about the division of labor. This concept of division of labor is implicit, if not explicit, in Hamilton's report on the subject of manufacturers, where he was talking about creating a larger division of labor through manufacturers, which manufacturers would transform the agricultural production, free up more labor to go into more manufacturing. That's the division of labor. That's an issue of the division of labor. Um, is it equivalent or comparable to um, uh, speci specialization? Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's part of it. I'll get to that. Yeah. Okay. 